Angela Lansbury, well she's a legend, she was an MGM, not quite a star, but a supporting player during the 40s and during the 1960s she became a big Broadway star, of course, with MAME. When I met her, she was rather sad. Her mother, who she, to whom she was very, very close, had died a couple of months before. I found her intelligent, noble, quite beautiful and reticent. I never really got through her guard. She did talk, of course, about her time at MGM, which I was particularly interested in. And I did ask her about whether there were gay actors and the attitude of Louis B. Mayer to them, which she did answer. She was one of a number of people that I put on a list the day I arrived at Gay News. I was up told by the editor, Dennis Lemon, Right, a list, love. Who do you want to interview? Angela Lansbury was pretty near the top. And I got to interview the great Angela Lansbury. And she is still going strong. And I did ask her the big question, why she turned down the title role in The Killing of Sister George. And she answers it. You might not like the answer, but she answers it. Good. How do you take it? Um, um, just milk. Milk. Yes. Okay. Awfully sad about uh, the Angela Badley, wasn't it? I know. I know. She wasn't. Probably ages since you'd interviewed. Oh uh, well, it wasn't actually. It was. It was just a few weeks ago. And the day the interview came out, she uh, took ill and you know, left yeah. the show. And they had massive flu. They had about seven of the cast out. Really? And uh, I think because they closed, they were going to close it anyway before she died. Yes. But uh, it's a shame, I and mean, it's a shame for lots of reasons, really. Mm, it really is. It's something sort of unfinished. Although she had uh, just that she had never been able to really enjoy the success God, yes, yes. upstairs and downstairs because she was never free of it. She was always doing it, you know. If she'd had a yeah. bit of a breather, then she could have just sort of coasted on the wave of success and gone to America and so on. Because she really was so popular all over the world. Absolutely. Which is, a, which is amazing. I mean, very few yeah. actors ever get in that position, don't Absolutely they? Absolutely not. And, um, and yet she was the least vulnerable no, about it, you know. No, she she we just get my uh, sweetener. There's only yeah. happened with Edward G. Robinson. I mean, he was, I, I really? saw him and then yeah. he died. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I have that to laugh. Yes, I'm sure he did. I used to work for another magazine called She. And yes. um, they were a very good magazine. They always um, showed the interview to the people before it was published, which you know, yes. a few magazines do. And unfortunately, they had a thing about not interviewing anyone above the age of 30, which meant that you were you know, yes. always interviewing promising people. Yes. And the trouble today with promising people is that they, they never quite uh, You never get beyond achieve. being promising, no, do they? Because there's no, there's no, um, there's no continuity of parts anymore. You're just in a TV series and you make a big hit right. for a film. That's right. And uh, you know, it's very different. But I mean, the one good thing about the star system, which I think, mm -hmm. I think um, yeah, Edward G. Robinson and Betty Davis said that. But the one good thing about it was at least it kept you working and mm -hmm. polishing and in the public eye. Oh, indeed. Uh, I think that's true. Uh, they say people are, in England are terribly loyal to artists, and I think it's true. Uh, for instance, I was terribly pleased when Dorothy Tutin got the, yeah. the yeah. award this year for yeah. Months in the Country, because although she never stopped doing awfully good work, nevertheless, for a while there, she was sort of eclipsed by a whole new school of, uh, not a new school of act actresses, but certainly a new uh, crop, you know. But talent will out in the end, and it, it, it does endure, which is um, very comforting, I think. It, it seemed to be true in your case, because you were pushed into the most ghastly collection of things, weren't you, the, you know, the Randolph Scott? Yes, I was uh, talking about that the other night, arts. funnily enough, yes. Um, how did you feel about that? I mean, did, did you feel, you know, after getting the star treat, the MGM terribly um, ignored? You know, I mean, did, you, did you sort of not care what you did in, in, in the No, it wasn't that at all. You see, I was at MGM for seven years. And when I left, it was the beginning of television, sort of moving in and pushing the movies out of the way. 
And uh, so I chose rather an unfortunate time to leave Metro, to have the security of a big studio behind me. And I well, not only did that, but I got married and I started a family. And suddenly movies weren't coming as fast and as thickly as they had been when I was under contract. And I was forced to do all sorts of jobs that normally if I'd been under contract, I would never have been asked to do, nor would I have, have agreed to, you know, participate in. Um, but the point is, when you're young, you don't give a damn, and you forget that all these things are going to be marked up against you or for you uh, later on, and you're going to look back and people are going to dig them up, particularly in England, I find. It's very interesting to me that, uh, that there's a whole um, generation of very serious movie buffs in England who s have made studies of directors and actors, actresses, stars, and so on, and who know every... Uh, infinitesimal detail about one's career more than I do in some instances they remember things that I have forgotten and this is a, quite a surprise and uh, it's very interesting because they're almost academic about their approach to movies one well, wonders if they're even entertained at times they, yeah. they examine so carefully how a thing is put together and how a person acted and what phase they were going through at the time and <laughs> etc. you know. And movies are so far behind me that I've almost forgotten about my movie career. Yeah, actually the first question I like, what coming along, I thought we were going to ask, and I thought the yeah. first question was what, you know, why aren't you making films? Why aren't I making movies? Well, because um, I became a, a stage star in the States, you see. In 1966 I opened in Maine and from that moment, I, I never had a chance. I did make two movies after that. One was uh, Dead Knobs and Broomsticks for Walt Disney, and the second was uh, Black Flowers for the Bride. Uh, those are the only two. I've been asked to do some movies, and uh, I've turned them down. I say that advisedly. Uh, I don't like to talk about things that I was offered and that I turned down that other people didn't make a great success in, but there is a picture that's out at the present time that's had nine Academy Award nominations, including the character that I decided not to play. So uh, I, I suppose I've made some mistakes, but I don't regret having made them. I'm very glad. I, at least I sleep nights. <laughs> As, uh, and you, you don't think you would have done if you'd have, if you'd have sort of tried for a more uh, high-powered career? Well, no, I don't think I would. I don't think I would have had as much personal happiness as I've had. Do you think you could have been, uh, you know, as big a star as someone like Betty Davis? You had all the sort of high, high-powered acting ability. Had I had I been uh, pushed and a little uh, easily pretty uh, as a young woman, I think I could have been. Yes, I think MGM might have really got behind me and made a star out of me. But they weren't the same. You see, they were a different kettle of fish than Warner Brothers. Uh, they made a different kind of product than Warner Brothers. Each studio in those days was known for the kind of picture it made. And Warner Brothers were interested in actresses. They had a lot of actresses under contract. Geraldine Fitzgerald and uh, Betty Davis uh, and others. MGM also had actresses, but they were more than actresses. They were great stars in the L.B. Mayer tradition, like Bria Garson and... Uh, people like that. Of course, the MGM also had some damn good actresses like Hepburn and, uh, well, they're too innumerable to mention it because there was an enormous stable of stars. But some of them were, were what, what I call personalities rather than actresses. And MGM tended to do more of that kind of thing. They had huge uh, kind of producer networks that made only great musicals, like Arthur Freed, you know, who just did great musicals, and I was in a couple of them, which was fine. But it was almost like a stock company, you see, like a repertory in those days. And was it, I mean, do you remember sort of sitting in the canteen and seeing Garbo sweep past or something? Like oh, that? yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, they were all there, not Garbo. She left. She left after Two-Faced Woman, which was her last movie with George Kukul. And uh, she was never at MGM when I was there. but. Gable was there, although he was in uniform, and uh, all the rest of them were there. What was Gable like in uniform? Oh, fantastic. And they really did look as, as good as they did on the Oh, screen. absolutely, yes. 
I mean, the movie stars really behaved and looked in the full tradition, and uh, it was expected, and they wouldn't have been under contract to Metro or kept by Metro unless they agreed to go along with the gag, as it were. Well, did you? I did as, as best I could, but coming from England and with my sort of, oh, rather sort of middle-class artistic background, uh, also my labor background, uh, didn't have the same ability to throw myself into this sort of glamorous make-believe existence that, that some people did. In other words, I, it was very important to have the status symbols, and uh, I did my best, but I didn't carry it off quite with the flair that I should, probably should have done. Did they um, say, we'd like you to go to this nightclub tonight so that you can be, you know, could appear in the weather Parsons gossip column? The next no, morning? they wouldn't do that so much, but they certainly would uh, encourage one to go, be seen at premieres. Premieres were the big outings in those days, if you remember. And you saw them as, you saw them as outings, they were fun. Oh, I yes. suppose you, it was a chance to see some films. Free tickets, yes. you know, free studio limousines, yeah. the loan of a of a, of a, of a yeah. gown, yeah. and usually you were sometimes introduced to another sort of young contract player, male, uh, who would escort you, you know. Could you tell me some of your escorts? Oh, gosh. Well, of course, I heard Hatfield was one of my ex. Yeah. Do you ever heard who played the story in Ray? Yes, I have. Ross Hunter. Oh, yes. Yeah. Became a producer. Did he, did he produce any of your films? No. I've never worked for Ross. Isn't it funny? We're good friends, but. I've never worked for him. And of course, finally, Peter Shaw, who I married. He, he just was an escort. Well, right? he wasn't an escort. Right. He was under contact with the studio. And, as, uh, as we met on a sort of blind date situation. Not yeah. going to a premiere, but to going to a house party on weekends. Yeah. So, uh, that whole era is, is a little bit muddied in my mind, but I'm going to think about it one day because it's fun to remember how it really was how the studio system worked and how one fitted into it and how it really affected my career and me as a person. How do you think it affected you as a person? Um, well, it, it answered the need for me as a person to experience a very glamorous style of life at a studio. It is something I'd always had an ambition for as a child, and I realized my ambition fully, finally. I didn't immediately at MGM, although to, to the outward eye, yes, I did. I mean, anybody set looking and reading about me in the newspapers would have said, gosh, that girl's hit it big. Well, I did, of course, but it still wasn't the real Thing, and I didn't experience total stardom until I did MAME on Broadway many, many years later, which was actually uh, 21 years later. What so it, it took that long for me to, to really have full stardom. Total stardom means, means what? It means that you write your own ticket, it means. It means you, you get 10% of the gross and you uh, can are, you can, you can, they can raise money on your name. You can sell tickets, in other words. You're not a star, really, unless you can sell tickets in the States. Mm. And I suppose total star gives you a right to be a bitch as well, does it? To sure, <laughs> if it suits you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, as interesting, so your labour background, though, um, yeah. did you find that MJ was a very class structured society, you know, that, um, that everyone had their own place? Oh, right? yes. Absolutely. You started quite meanly at the bottom, even though I was signed at $500 a week when I was 17 in 1943, which was an awful lot of money. I mean, it really was. I still had to take a sort of class D dressing room on the lot, and uh, I had to work my way up into the star building until finally, before I left, I had a featured star dressing room. Not a star suite mind you, which would have been the full treatment, yes. you see. The suite had the double bed in it and it had the sitting room and the bathroom. So you could sleep there the night? Oh yes. Yeah. 
lots of the stars used to. Brando used to. Um, and he had a special bed in his dressing room, which there was always a lot of talk about that. And uh, a lot of nonsense went on in dressing rooms. You can be sure. Yeah. It would have been very unnatural if it hadn't. Is it gone in your dressing room? Oh, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me about these different, the difference in dressing rooms. Was it just size? Furnishings or what? Size, furnishings, pictures on the wall. So a star dressing room would be rather like this room. It would be, in fact, how you would want to furnish your house. Yes, it would. And everybody had their own style. There was a tremendous sort of vogue for knotted pine in those days, mm -hmm. if you remember. And the men had terribly sort of leather and knotted pine rooms with early American bits and pieces all over the place. And, uh, they used an awful lot of... Uh, Scotch plaid curtains and things. The women had very sort of luxurious um, satin draperies and frilly curtains, all sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, you had it, if you were the, uh, the reigning star, uh, they would redo it for you every two weeks if you wanted. So you know, because they simply stuff. brought in the, in, the, in the studio prop department and the, uh, the best designer on the lot, who was also doing sets, he would also do a star dressing room as a favour. You know, he'd also do the star's house, not as a favour, but uh, everything was made very easily available uh, in those old studio days. You could get anything done. You could get pictures sort of um, copied in the prop shop. You know, you could utilise all the services of the studio if you were big enough. You'd also get your tickets settled. You know, things like that. The police department in the studio was, were able to handle parking tickets. You never had to worry about things like that in those days. And there were the unpleasant effects, weren't there? There were the things that you could get done which perhaps weren't very good for you. Like Probably the, not. Um, obviously, one well, thinks of Judy Garland, that she was yes. um, given medication which perhaps she was too young to really uh, yes. adjust to. Absolutely. Um, certainly the, the figure of Louis B. Mayer is um, controversial to say the least. In some eyes he's seen as a very shrewd, wise man that genuinely looked after people's mm. careers and cared about these people. On the other hand, he's seen as this very vindictive, um, vicious man that um, really didn't care about anyone at all. Well, it's hard to say about a man like Mayer. I'm sure he believed that he was wise and just and talented and intuitive and indeed I think he was he ha had a feeling about people about stars about their potential and I think he had the knack of getting the right people together to produce a product <coughs> have a great deal of class and the earmark of a big MGM picture you know. Excuse me. Hello. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, mate, put two aside for me, will you? And listen, um, I may get down now. I may, I might come down in about uh, 45 minutes. What time do you close? Okay. Or either tonight or tomorrow. All right? Thanks. Bye. Uh, the trouble with people that have a tremendous amount of power, like Louis B. Mayer, is I think they sort of lose sight of reality. And they think they're being very kind, and they go through the motions of being awfully just. But that doesn't prevent them five minutes later from making some absolutely dastardly decision against somebody else. Do you understand? I mean, they, mm. they, they have this marvelous sort of front of jovial kindness, and geniality. And yet, to maintain their position and their power, they have to also retain this ruthless quality, which, when need be, they exercise. And uh, the ruthlessness is the thing that one's, one remembers in people. Uh, I don't know of any absolutely ruthless acts that he was responsible for, except possibly uh, Judy. But I'm sure he thought he was doing her a favor because certainly the studio wasn't dependent totally on Judy for revenue. They had other big stars who were making pictures that were making money. Therefore, it wasn't as if MGM was going to fall. 
if Judith was unable to function or she got fat. He, he genuinely thought he was helping the little girl. And I think he, he, said he used any means. I'm not defending him. I'm simply trying to justify this peculiar mode of behavior that some very powerful people indulge in. You were trained as an actress, weren't you, before yes. you actually went there? Oh, yeah. um, there were yeah. quite, a few, quite a few people at MGM that weren't professional actors, were they? That they had literally been discovered, like yeah. Lana Turner, mm. um, as high school students. Yes. Um, did you find that they were any less able to cope with success than the ones who were professionally trained, or didn't it really matter? It didn't make a damn bit of difference. Yeah. It's always up to the individual to be able to handle success. It depends on the, the emotional structure of the person yeah. and whether they believe, whether they choose to believe everything that's written about them. Yeah. And if they choose to feel that they're entitled to the way they're treated all the time and kowtowed to, which you are to a great extent in the studio by people yeah. and certainly by the public on Hollywood Boulevard in those days. Well, what, what happened, actually? Well, I mean, the sort of uh, adulation and shouts and applause and ooey, oohs and ahs that one gets as a starlet, getting out of a car, going into a movie house. You're one of the chosen few. You're a, a, gl a glittering image. You're um, a shadow on the screen. And when they see you in the flesh, people go slightly gaga. I mean, they really do. They used to. They still do if they see Paul Newman or somebody like that on the street, you know. Women go slightly mad. This must have been an incredibly heady experience just to come from England and to make a uh, couple of pictures and then suddenly mm. be at MGM. Uh, how did you cope with it all? Did you have a, um, a strong family? I had a very strong family. My mother was a marvelous sort of rock of, <laughs> of um, stability and young brothers and life was too real too close to me uh, I came from wartime England my sister was still here the war was very much with us that we had got out didn't uh, stop us from being aware that there was the old world was suffering dreadfully and we were very affected by that America was not in the war at that time when we first went to America although certainly it was in 1943, because let's see, Pearl Harbor was 42. But there wasn't the same sense of imminency as there was here, about invasion, etc. So all of that, uh, and uh, as you, you mentioned, coming from a pretty solid Labour family, you know, yes. family of socialists and uh, hard-working people, I certainly didn't have any illusions about my own importance and uh, still don't, which is a disappointment to some people because they do expect uh, actresses who've come through the Hollywood mill to have a certain veneer of glamour and <laughs> unpredictability. And this was came into prominence when you played Maine, didn't it? And yes. They wanted you to be a certain type of They certainly scholar. did, yes they did. I think it's the closest part that, that came to going to my head slightly, Maine did. Mm -hmm. Because Maine was came at a time I was forty when I did Maine, and I it just picked me up and tossed me around like a um, snowflake, and I suddenly was lighter than air, and everything was possible, and I was the toast of the town. Well, to hit that kind of success at that age it was heady to say the least, and it um, it brought with it all of that, but it also brought with it for me a great deal of disquiet because my children were just in their teens and uh, it was very upsetting to them I think for their mother who had been the lady at home suddenly to be you know the toast of New York and not at home and not at home right although well, they, they did come along with me to New York we had to leave everything that we all were very used to which was living in Malibu California mm -hmm. Having a very steady early life, you know. <laughs> About some more tea. Yes, yes, yes.
quite the stone cold. Were there times, um, particularly at MGM, and perhaps when you left MGM, when you saw parts which you knew you could play absolutely brilliantly, yes. just go to somebody else mm. who was a bigger star because they were glamorous, or, being, or perhaps more cooperative, I don't know if you were. Oh, no, nothing, it had nothing to do with cooperation. It was it had to do with the fact that although I was quite young, I had tremendous maturity and authority as an actress, even when I was a kid. And therefore, I could have played parts that girls who were older than I was, who were bigger, big stars like Lana Turner and uh, not Deborah Carr, because she and I are about the same age, actually. I'm older than she is, in fact. But I could have played a lot of parts that they played. So something like um, Long Turns Part in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, mm. you could have played. Could have played that. The Jacks. <laughs> yes, exactly. Could have played Lady de Winter in the, in the Three Musketeers instead of the Queen of France, yeah. which I did play. Yeah. And I really tried very hard to get that part, and I tried to get L.B. Mayer to give it to me, and I went to him and I asked him to let me play it. And uh, he led me on, but of course in the end I didn't. They had to give it to her. They didn't have anything else for her, mm. and they were paying her five thousand dollars a week. So they had to give us, you know, had to give her visit. Yeah. Well, at least that was their excuse. Yeah. Um, now the theatre has, has simply eclipsed the movies for me, and uh, I must say I love it. And I think if I hadn't come back to the theatre, my movie career might have fizzled out. I don't know. Do you like having the days free? Is that one of the things you like? Yes, love that. Love that. I love being free to move around the world, which I do now. And I'm not stuck in, in, in California, which I had a basin for, really, you know, 25 years. And. Uh, I can sort of nip around and live, have mini pads, which is great. Have one sort of lovely holiday house that we have in Ireland, where we spend a lot of time, where I can do the things I really like to do. And I'm never on, not for a moment, you know. And uh, I'm going back to New York in May, and I shall. Uh, possibly do a, a summer tour of Maine and a big industrial show or American show. And I, so I, the, the interesting thing is I can sort of mix and match what I do. I don't have to just play very heavy stuff like Hamlet. I can go back and do another musical if I feel like it. I have sort of three careers going in three different places, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They don't bump into each other, which is great. It seems to me you've, um, you've someone that would sort of write very good parts for you was someone like Stephen Sondheim, who did Anyone Can Whistle yes. For. But I could see you particularly in company playing uh, the Fathers of Men's Stretch Play yes. in company. Yeah. Did you, um, Anyone Can Whistle, such one of those strange shows that people talk about, but very few of them actually yes. have seen it, because I, right, I didn't see it. Um, the did, yes, I, I heard the record, but I found it strange. I think it's yes. like a lot of Sondheim, it takes a lot of time to get it into. Does. It does. Um, what went wrong? I'm sure we've talked about it many times, but if you just uh, briefly say. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm afraid it, it, I think the story was a little presumptuous. Um, it presumed to lay bare the subject matter which was extremely crucial and hurtful at that time in American history. It had to do with civil rights and the, the, the beginnings, the first stirrings, the first sad beginnings of the civil rights movement uh, in, in the South, Southern states. And it, it had an almost jokey air about portions of it, although the, the theme was terribly serious. It, I think there was a comment on the situation which was misunderstood and some audiences took great exception to it, and there were almost fights in the aisles some nights. It only played nine performances in New York, you know. But um, it was on the road, of course, in Philadelphia for three weeks, and everybody came to see it. 
Now, there were those who just were so mad keen about it, they couldn't bear it. And there were others who just didn't like it at all. So it was a tragedy of good intentions, I'm sure. And uh, I think it was a, a classical failure. I think Steve's work was terrific. I admire him inordinately, and I think that uh, it's one of the best things he did. He has a ballet in it in the second act. Herbert Ross did the ballet, and it was quite extraordinary and wonderful, best part of the second act. What kind of ballet was it? It was a ballet a story, story ballets, really, that fitted in nightmares, dreams, all to do with the story itself. And uh, it just didn't hit it off, and that was all there was to it. I came out of it very well, and it was the beginning of my musical career. So I put great score by it, store by it, because it started me off. If I hadn't done that, I never would have done name, and uh, the things I did subsequently. So I, I love it. <laughs> And it's, um, some people say, well, will you revive it one day? Well, who knows, maybe we will. Don't know. I've got this specific overture of how oh, gave this to me the other so night, but I can't play because I haven't got a turntable. I've only got a tape machine. That was taken at the Steve Sondheim Benefit in New York. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Which was um, the night we all got up and sang Steve's songs, which was super. It was a great night, I must say. You work for Hal Prince, didn't you? With no, I you never have. I don't. It got accepted in the Black Class for the That's Pride. what I mean. Yes. yes. Yeah. That which yes. is his first and so far. Did you last. see that movie? Yes, I did. I was very disappointed with it here. because I, don't know. Um, I, I, I enjoyed the book. I thought the book was marvelous because mm. I love food. <laughs> uh, it was a brilliant idea to have a villain that was killing people off by, you know, <laughs> kindness almost. Feeding them to and death. And of course that part of the, uh, it didn't come over at all, did it? I mean, no. the, the whole character has changed. Yes. Um, and of course, the the more sort of dec more decadent side of things was stressed, wasn't it? You know, the sort of the yes, it was the bisexual aspect. Yes. Um, but you, did you enjoy making the film? Um, yes, I did. I enjoyed some of it. We were stuck in Füssen, you know, in Germany for months. I say months, three months we were there, and that was a bit. Difficult. We, we, we shot it under difficult conditions, and uh, but I love the company and everybody in it was terrific. Yeah. Did you like Jane Carr? Oh yes, <laughs> marvelous that, that little pudding. She's a lovely slim girl now. I'm, I ran into her on the street one day. <laughs> I couldn't get over it. How do you see women's roles um, in in theatre and um, uh, films today? I mean, do you. Uh, the, this big thing that hardly anyone writes roles for women anymore and it's all male bonding films. It's absolutely yeah. true. It's absolutely true. There are so few good women's roles, it's pathetic. Why do you think this is? Because in the 30s they wrote very, very good, intelligent women's roles and then suddenly... There's no needle certainly wrote wonderful women's roles. Barry, people like Pat, you know, O'Neill and Barry, my goodness, uh, far cry from each other. Nevertheless, they both wrote good women. Um, I can't answer that. I really don't know. Uh, perhaps it's the uh, the fact that women are ceasing to be romantic figures. Is that possible? It's just a thought. Well, it could be that um, now that they're beginning to question things, mm. people that question things that aren't particularly romantic, are they? Because they no. tend to be rather irritating because they keep asking questions all the time. And I was thinking yeah. particularly of the character you played in Manchurian Candidate, that she was shown to be a woman of, of great um, intellectual capacity, but her intellectual capacity being used to the bad rather than to the good. And in a lot of films, intelligent women are shown as the villainesses rather yes. than the goodies. And, uh, yes. You very seldom find an, an interesting, intelligent, a nice woman in all this. Um, it's very true. I suppose they're not interesting to write. And uh, where do you go from there? You know, sort of thing. Uh, I always said that I enjoyed playing bitches. People always say, well, do you enjoy playing bitches? Are you a bitch yourself? You must be a bit of a bitch to play such good bitches. <laughs> well, who, I guess we're all a bit bitchy somewhere. We've all got a bit of the bitchiness. Yes, absolutely. 
otherwise we, we wouldn't recognize it in others. We wouldn't be aware. I think um, if you are aware of bitterness in others, you, you can use that information or you can use uh, the effect that has on you to turn around and play a bitch rather well. I don't think you have to be a bitch in other words to play one. But you have to be very vulnerable <coughs> to be able to play a good bitch. Yeah. Some of your women characters have been very um, dominant and masculine, but they haven't actually been lesbian, have they? You've never actually played a lesbian. Before. No, I've never played a lesbian. Have you ever no. been offered a lesbian? Uh, yes, I was. Which one was it? It was um, the one, the one with Charlie in it. Oh, it Killing was? a Sister George. Yes. In the film version. Yes. Robert Aldrich. Robert Aldrich came to New York. Well, he really wanted me very much to play Sister George. That, you know, yes. And uh, I was doing something else, and I didn't, I didn't do it. I didn't want to play a lesbian actually at that time, and that's. Uh, I, I wasn't that mad about the play. I hadn't seen it. I'd only read it. And uh, I can't think what year that was. In 1969, I think. And not very many women played immediately recognized the lesbian roles. They do today, but they, they didn't then. So I suppose that had a bearing on my decision. Would you play anything today if it uh, was offered to you? That part? Mm. No, I don't think so. Because I don't think the part interested me that much. I didn't want to play that role. I'm, I'm really awfully picky about what I want to play. I only want to play things that I think I'm going to enjoy playing, mm -hmm. that I'm going to like, like myself in. Mm -hmm. You know? Just wondering how you see. Um Socialist Britain now. I mean, do you, the way that socialism has perhaps changed now, really, because I'm thinking particularly in, in relation to um, changes in um, social changes that, that, that uh, socialism has brought about, you know, different acts that have been passed, and just the general social mm -hmm. climate, you know, including abortion, birth control, homosexuality, of course, and that's what I well, I think Britain has certainly been a, a front runner in uh, putting through a, a tremendous amount of reforms. It's been awfully realistic. Um, and there seems, it seems to be a certain confusion at the moment between what is legally acceptable and what is sort of morally frowned on. I don't know, there seems to be an area there of um, uncertainty. But I think that's just a time problem, and it'll only be a question of time. But it's the point is that it takes people a long time to absorb a truth, you know. And if we're, what are we talking about now? We're we talking about abortion. Uh, women's lib and uh, homosexuality. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. yes. mm. Basically, people's right to do in their private life yes. what they want to do. Absolutely. Was um, Hollywood in the 40s very um, free morally? I mean, you were there just before the, the witch hunts. You were mm -hmm. dead just before the witch hunts. Um, was it a very free-thinking place politically? I mean, did you talk about politics at the studio, or did you not talk about serious subjects? I don't think so. I don't think we talked about politics. We certainly didn't talk about the social climate in those days. We talked about the next president, you know, but one never, one, one really didn't talk about politics a great deal. At least I didn't. Did you did you feel your politics were blunted by being in Hollywood? Do you think that um, you, know, yes. you, were, you were kept in a hermetic 
pursue? Yes, I do. I do think so because I think America in the late in the forties, it was just quotes a democracy, and everybody shouted and talked the democratic way of life, and we all thought, well, we're all living it. Aren't we lucky? We're in it. It's the greatest country in the world, the strongest, the best fed. America was a sort of a glory power at that time, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Let's face it. It, it. it was only after the war, after the death of Roosevelt, and after the beginning of the problems, the post-war problems of the country coming out of a war, which brought it home to people that it wasn't necessarily working the democratic ideal and so on. And then McCarthyism was a terrible blow did you, in fact, know anybody that was involved in the, the witch hunts? Oh, yes. We all did. I mean, certainly we did. But it, it wasn't just a, a small core of people. It was a, no, in every department. it was not. It was very, very um, uh, evident in the, all the studios what was going on. And uh, there were the... the there were the, um, the... the pro-McCarthy people, and there were the anti-McCarthy people. And you knew who they were, you know. I, as an, as an immigrant, didn't get into anything. I couldn't because I wasn't American, and therefore, I, you know, I didn't have any. I sort of kept my mouth shut, as one does when you're a visitor in a country. You try not to take sides. It must be very difficult for you, isn't it? It wasn't difficult for me because I am apolitical, apolitical. Okay. <laughs> I'm in. I'm very, very interested, but I. I don't have much, uh, I, I believe in my own opinions, but I don't believe in them to the extent that I want to broadcast them around. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think there's a tendency for people to listen to actors when they talk, because they are actors and they're well known, and sometimes actors, if they get a taste of politics, get carried away by the fact that people will listen to them. Mm -hmm. Did and you I, know Ronald Reagan at all? Did I know him? Yes. Oh yes, absolutely. That was when he was married to Jane Wyman, was it, or was it before? No, I, I didn't know him until he married uh, Nancy, his present wife. Mm -hmm. And we all lived quite close together, actually, before. When he, he was the president of the Screen Actors Guild for a number of years, and a very good one, I might add, and a Democrat in those yeah. days. And then he became a Republican, I suppose. Maybe he was always a Republican. I don't think so. I think he was a Democrat. Then he became a Republican. and. Um, then, what do you know, he's off to the white, uh, you know, off to uh, Sacramento, and he's the governor. But, uh, I mean, uh, we all used to see each other quite a lot. Our kids were of the, of the same age, and we lived fairly close. Um, thinking of the influences your children must have had when they were growing up, what about the influences that you had as a child? Were, did you know lots of political figures that had come to the house? Well, I was taken an awful lot to the House of Commons and to uh, speech-making um, forays like the Albert Hall and yes. so on, to, to hear my grandfather. Only the further, the excitement and the crowds and the shouting and the noise and the, the theatrical aspects of the political meetings, I, did, I think, did make a tremendous impact on me. Do you see any similarities between you and your grandfather? No, I don't. Of course not. <laughs> I wouldn't to dare to put myself in the same room so with him a, um, as a person. You have a very good, um, good economy of words, you know, you don't, you don't spare words, you know, when you mm. say something it's absolutely to the point, you know, this is it. it's mm. making a speech and putting a point over in exactly the same thing. I'm not <laughs> saying you're making a speech, but the economy of words to get ideas over, yes. which is, is very noticeable. Well, I don't know, it never occurred to me, you're the first person who's ever said that. Um, so many things. I mean, if I just sort of run, th uh, should I just run through sure, a few of the like topics, and if any catch your interest? Yeah. Um, I'm interested in, in the portrait of Dorian Gray, mm. which was your first um, real film, and also mm. about the director, who I understand was mm. quite a little bit different to the usual Hollywood director. Oh yes, um, Albert Lewis. Albert Lewis. We used that was to call him the Metronome. <laughs> well, he worked out at the Metro, did he? Yes. Ah. He was a professor of English at Columbia University in New York, and he went to, me to Metro. I think he had three properties in his pocket that he wanted to make movies of. Uh, one was The Moon and Sixpence, one was Pandora and The Flying Dutchman, and one was uh, 
um, a picture of Dorian Gray. Uh, I think he was a story editor. I'm not sure that I'm right about this, and somebody will call me on the coals. One of your buffs, English buffs, will say, no, no, he wasn't a story editor, but I thought he was one of the story editors at MGM. Or maybe he was an associate producer under Thalberg or something. But anyway, he finally <coughs> got his chance not only to be a producer, but to direct. He's a very small man with a hearing aid. And uh, he literally had a, a gramophone record in his head of how he wanted to hear the dialogue spoken. And he would give you line readings until he heard it exactly on his little gadget that he wore in his pocket, which he spoke into until he heard it right, then, then he would print the take if, he, if your voice matched this little record in his head that he could hear. And this was the way he worked. He was an extraordinary person. His, uh, he had the patience of Job, I must say. And I think he's the one director who did 125 or could have been 135 takes of one scene involving George Sanders and Herd Hatfield in a carriage. I did probably 80 takes with him. Was that to be a song? No. It wasn't? No, no. It was in a scene with somebody else. Yeah. The song went very well, very easily. Anything musical with me always went very easily. Yeah. Well, in fact, you didn't really sing in, until uh, anyone from this song. I did sing that song, yes. Yeah, but you, you sang oh, yeah, it, but yeah. I mean, you didn't no. actually appear in the music. No, true, true. Because, no. Uh, um, well, Judy Garland, you didn't sing the Harvey Girls. You didn't sing in that, did you? You were just uh, nasty. Now so to somebody else's yes. voice. Mm. Yes. <coughs> um, was it difficult playing an actress at seventeen? Is it difficult to play an actress? You mean in, in the picture of Dorian Gray? Yeah. yeah, not hardly, because she really wasn't an actress. She was just a little girl who sang in a music hall, and uh, it was just a dive. It wasn't even a music hall, if you remember. Yeah, I didn't see the. It's like an opium den. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And was, um, was it considered quite decadent to do that film? Because I understand that quite a lot of the decadence does come over. The decadence does come over, but it isn't there unless you know it's there. It's very interesting. Yeah. Do you, you think that was why he wanted times. so many takes of certain scenes to get that right level? I do think Wh so. Yeah. Uh, yes, for the censorship, I explain. Probably. Mm. Um, uh, Cecil B. the Mill from uh, Samson and Delilah. Yes. You had, a very, very strange, <laughs> you had a very strange part in that, didn't you? <laughs> yes, I sure did. Um, it was all right. It was a marvellous bit of make-believe. didn't interest me too much. Would you like to play Delilah? It never occurred to me that I could play Delilah, no. no. Well, was what a, was Victor Mature like to work with? <laughs> he was a, they used to call him the great chunk of man. He really was all of that. He was terrified of the lion. And he really was. And he had a second to do all the stunts, you know. He wouldn't go anywhere near that lion, although the lion had no teeth and constipation. <laughs> <laughs> and did you enjoy working with George Sanders again? Had he changed in the meantime between the Dorian Gray and uh, And Bellamy. And oh, Bellamy. That's yes. why he was in Samson too. Yes, yes that's yeah. right. Uh, George was always good for a laugh on those occasions. He, he took it all with a grain of salt and his sort of sardonic humour uh, could uh, lighten the day. Although actually George could be terribly boring uh, sometimes. He was such a baby, George Sanders. He was very petulant and needed to be patted and prodded a lot to do, you know, to work. Because he was just bored stiff. I mean, he was a man who should have been a diplomat or something, or a spy. He never should have just been a, a movie actor. Yeah. Yeah. And how about Judy Garland? Did you know her very well? Yeah, I didn't know her terribly well. I mean, we didn't... Uh, I knew her more towards the end of her life. She used to come and see me in Maine and come and sit and talk to me in the dressing room. She loved to talk about old times. And she... It was as if she wanted to remember times between her and me that actually had never existed. She wanted to feel we'd been old friends, and we hadn't. And I understood this need on her be behalf to try and re-establish friendship, because so many of the people that, that had been around her were gone, who had been near and dear to her at MGM. 
and I was one of the few people that was sort of left. And therefore, when she came to see me in New York, uh, she wanted to sit and talk about the old days. And yet she and I really had very little to share, except our common experience on the Harvey girls. And um, being on the lot together, of course. We used to travel back and forth to location in the car and things like that. But I used to get as pissed off with her as everybody else did because, you know, I'd be there ready at nine o'clock in the morning and she wouldn't turn up till 12. You'd be sitting around. This was on the Harvey This was oh, as yes. early as the Harvey Oh, yes. And this was um, fear or pride or. Well, she was going through, she just, I think she just got married to Vincent Minnelli or something at the time, and uh, it was all a bit fraught, you know, she'd done Meet Me in St. Louis, and then she was doing the Harvey Girls, and then she was going to do the Pirate afterwards, and she was terribly thin and, and ill from too many diet pills, and this was the time when she dieted herself literally down to nothing. That's another perk of total star, isn't it? Like actually turning up. Mm. Have you ever felt tempted to abuse total star? Do you think it, it's more been tempted. I've been tempted, yes, I have at times. But I haven't. My dreadful c Christian conscience <coughs> always sort of comes to the fore and says, uh uh. You know, you, you've simply got to be responsible, and you can't do that. Is this um, missing a performance? Or, yes. Or trying to direct a director? Or, or change no, no, I don't hesitate to try and direct a director under certain circumstances if I feel that I've got something to offer which was going to help the situation. I wouldn't have a direct director. I'd simply say, look, I don't agree with you, and can I, c could we try it this way? Which I think any artists should feel free to do after the number of years that I've been floating around in the business. You know. No, I mean uh, ducking a performance because something better turns up, uh, feigning sickness, or, or just burning the candle badly at both ends so you don't do a good job, you know. I think coming out and giving half a, a performance to an audience makes me sick to do that mm -hmm. because I haven't tended to my business and taken care of myself or something. You know? And so this would cover everything from, from looking good? I mean, you wouldn't mm -hmm. um, look scruffy? Or no, I don't think so. No. no, because I don't think that lets anybody down but yourself. And I think there's nothing worse than self-loathing about something, you know? very hard to live with that. It's very hard to live with your conscience when you know you're wrong, when you've done something rather rotten. Or at least I find it is. Some people can brush it off and they don't think about it twice. And I know people who are that way and I understand it thoroughly. And I don't hold it against them. I just know. That's all. Yes. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, there must have been times when you were in a project which you knew was a really a non-starter, mm. not just the, the Beatles, but I think it's something like In the Call of the Day, which was a new director. And um, what do you do in this? Is there anything you can do to change things, to get the script rewritten? To do you have any power whatsoever to make a, something that's bad into something that's better? Hardly, in pictures. You really, you could take a scene, three actors who were going to shoot a scene in a movie, could take a scene and sit down with the director and say, look, this is impossible. We cannot shoot it this way, the way it's written. Can we, may we try to rewrite this? Now, hopefully the writer somewhere around can be brought into the discussion and he will indeed write it or write revisions on the recommendations of the director and the actors. But. Uh, it's not going to uh, cure the ills of the movie if it's as weak all through as Cool of the Day was. It's That's just not going to do it. Was it a mixture of everything, or was there one particular fault? Was it the script, or was it the director? I think it was the script, and 
the casting, it was a sort of an English story, wasn't it? Mm. Curious Anglo-American story. Mm. I think the casting was difficult. I think Jane Fonda was miscast. Mm. Um, you could say I was miscast. Peter Finch was miscast. We were all sort of miscast. Mm. It's one of those instances where they hire a lot of sort of actor stars and then try and make a sort of person out of a sow's ear and that it doesn't work. Mm. The chemistry was wrong. Was Jane Fonda apolitical when she made that film, or, did, or was she so interested in what was going on around her? She didn't seem to be at all interested. She was absolutely self-involved and yeah. self-engrossed. You don't seem to worry about making personal statements about um, co-workers. A lot of people bend over backwards to be diplomatic. Do you, do you just don't care anymore, or have you never cared about saying what you feel about? I did used to care, but I don't anymore. I think that's a new freedom I found, mm. I've got now. I feel very free. I don't, I hope I'm not, I don't mean to be damaging. I mean, I, I obviously, I, It sounded like a damaging statement. I didn't mean it, it to it, me. No, it didn't to me, but it just seemed, um, it, it was an honest statement. It didn't seem damaging. Mm. But it's just that so many people are very worried about getting a bad reputation, you know, mm. not being, and, and getting in trouble, because it must be a very small world being an actor. Yes. And you must be always bumping into people you worked with before, and if they've yeah. read an interview where someone has said something, yeah. actors maybe get uptight. Yeah, well, they do. It's, yes, you have to be awfully careful. Were you ever in the Hollywood gossip columns? Did they ever try and manufacture any gossip about you? Not really, only in the lightest possible touch, you know, just sort of romantic nonsense when I was, when I was a kid. Did they pair you off with any, anyone? God, so long ago, I can't remember, they must have done dozens of people, but uh, one was always being paired off with this person and that. I mean, it was just part of the thing. They didn't have, it. if they didn't have a column, they made it up, you know, the columns like Hedda Hopper and Luella, there's people. But did, when you arrived in Hollywood, did they come and see you and try and see? Oh yes, they used to come on the set. They, they, they would come and visit the sets about once a week, and they'd be escorted down with their flowered hats by the unit publicity. Not together, though. Oh no. Separate occasions. Oh, always separate, yes. Well, Luella's one? coming down at four, dear, it's a, you know. <laughs> So everybody was just sort of lined up. <laughs> what were they like, these women? They were just amazing sort of ladies with hats and afflictions and all sorts of things, you know. They all had something of their own. Hedda had her hats and Luella didn't go around the studios very much because she was always a bit sort of shaky and you went to see her at her house. And when you were talking about people abusing power, like Louis Mayer, mm. I imagine they were very much, you know, the, the iron fist and the velvet glove. Oh, absolutely. Were, but did you know, were you clever enough to know this at 17? Or did you sort of talk your head off and get to misquote it? Well, I did used to, yes. But, I, I mean, I, one only, uh, I wasn't a very uh, outspoken, forthright person. I said what I thought they wanted to hear. I was at least clever enough to do that. That was the only way I was clever with them. I just didn't lead the kind of exciting, uh, uh, dangerous kind of uh, romantic life that some of the girls did, which yeah. they could report daily on. Therefore, I wasn't of enormous interest to them in that respect. I was interesting to them as a, as a casting item always, because I was being cast right, left and centre in some pretty marvellous things some wonderful movies and playing with some incredible actors and actresses. So the news with me was always, what was I going to act next, mm. not who was I going out with next. Of course, I had one marriage which caused a lot of furor, which was my first marriage, and that was all dutifully uh, written up and who did you gone over. I was married to um, Richard Cromwell. Oh, and Richard Cromwell was in... Um he was in a few films, wasn't he? Yes, he was. He was in the Lives of the Bengal Lancers with Gary Cooper and yes. uh, several. He was under contract to Columbia, but he'd really sort of given up acting when I met him, and he was a, a ceram ceramic artist. Yes. Uh, is he still alive? No, he died in 1960. 
but he was a terrific person and uh, great fun and really taught me a great deal about Hollywood that I would never have known, which I really loved. I, I loved the era of the 30s, which of course I had never been part of, but I had a great nostalgia for it, even though I never wasn't there during those years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he had and was very much part of it. And I think that was part of the reason I was so attracted to him, because he was part and parcel of the Crawford Harlow era. Yeah. I knew all about it and knew them and uh, was a, a, a real Hollywood person. Yeah. Did you find uh, film love scenes very difficult to do? Um, so you get the right mood under the hot lights. Yes, it's it's not easy. But it, it's interesting how how um, how cleverly they're done, and how well they're worked out. And they look as if they just happen right off the spur of the moment, but actually they were very very carefully planned and executed yeah. with a great deal of thought, practice, and rehearsal. You know. Yeah. Which do you think your, which do you is your most memorable scene? Because actually, looking, thinking back over your career, I can't really remember any memorable scenes. I can just remember memorable performances. Mm -hmm. um, did you sort of try and keep everything graded so there wouldn't be any one sort of standout scene, but try and sort of keep the keep the balance going? Oh no, I think that uh, if you think back on the roles, I hate that word, parts that I played. Why do you hate roles? Roles, that role. I don't know. It's just sort of a. A misnomer. Yes, it is. Like artiste. Pretentious, artiste, yeah. yes. Um, <laughs> I've played very few starring roles, as they say in, in America. Um, they've been mainly great supporting parts, the other woman, or the second woman. And um, you very seldom have a great scene if you're the second woman. And consequently, I have very few great scenes that sort of stick out in my memory as being great favorites. Although I'm happy to say that moviegoers and people who remember movies, they have favorite scenes of mine. And this came out certainly at the British Film Institute a couple of years ago when Rex Reed came over and we did with Mr. Sorensen an afternoon, you know. Yes, the John Player. Yeah, the John Player lecture. And uh, we had film clips from, I suppose, eight or ten films. And they were the good scenes out of those films. And I was absolutely flabbergasted to find that indeed, yes, there were some terrific kind of highs in these, what seemed to be quite small parts. Yeah. And they do it, they're there. And uh, certainly Manchurian Candidate has a tremendous scene when she's talking to her son and uh, instructing him yeah. as to how he's going to bump off the candidate. You know. Yes, I was maybe saying that communist. That communist part, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, Long Hot Summer <coughs> and Court Jester. There's, lo there's lots of sort of... Colchester was a, was a strange film, wasn't it? Really, it was yeah. a, um, an attempt to do something a little bit different. Mm. Um, it didn't quite come off, and your part was weird because it was almost straight, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Almost, but mm. not quite. Not quite. Um, mm. But there must be a lot of talent in that film. I mean, uh, Michael Curtis directed it. Didn't he? No, oh, it was uh, Norman. No, uh, it was uh, Frank. Fr Melvin uh, Frank. Melvin Frank. Melvin Frank. Yes. Frank, yeah. And you had uh, lovely people like Mildred Natwick, oh, didn't yeah. you? And Cecil Parker. And, C and, Cedric, uh, and Cedric Hardwick, wasn't it? Cedric Hardwick and Basil Rathbone. That's right, yes. And Danny Kaye Rathbone. himself. Uh, what's your opinion of Danny Kaye? Cause he's he just makes me laugh until I fall on the floor, scream and carry on. He just, he's a funny, the funny man, yes. The chalice yeah. from the palace is the proof that is true. That's right. <laughs> Pestle with a something, <laughs> I don't know. Mm. Albert Finney and I were trying to remember it the other day. Mm. Oh, uh, Gypsy, did you find it difficult to make that woman sympathetic? I didn't, because I just played her for real. 
real, real, real. And I think if you play somebody like that for real, you can't help but help but empathise with her in the end. You know, she's she's a, a kind of an amazing dame, even though she shouts and screams and carries on, and you get sick to death of her. Nevertheless, in the end, you say to yourself, "Well, she had something." And uh, I enjoyed playing it very much. I played it for a long time and I had enough, you know. Mm. But it was a terrific, it's a terrific part, Rose. Is it difficult to sing? Yes, it is. It must be very wearing on the voice, actually, the, uh, the last song. Yes, it, it is, because it, <coughs> it's really just sort of torn out of you, the last number, you know. And uh, it's very emotional. Or well, it's simulated emotion. People say, "Well, how can you do that?" It, it, it you tear your it tears your heart out. You know, it tears your throat out to go through that number. Well, it's all technique and a series of tricks and nonsense. You, because if you really did it as if you're tearing your guts out every every night, you you'd be finished after a week. So you have to learn how to do it so that you don't. That's something that people never understand. Is it, um, is it an inside thing, or is it possible to describe how you can do that? So no, it's, it's a, a mental thing. It's a mental, it's a technique, a mental technique, yeah. yeah. You had a marvellous entrance, didn't you? That must be, must be marvellous <laughs> for an actress to actually come from the other side. Come down the aisle, yeah. it's tremendous. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about um, technique and stuff in relation to love scenes, because in some respects you're basically dealing with real emotions and, may, and, and don't you find that perhaps you blunt your own emotions by trying to re recreating them in an unreal situation? Did you ever feel worried that you might be taken over uh, by your uh -huh. roles and you lose, you know, you lose your spontaneity as a person? In a love scene, you mean? Or, or, in, or in, anything, anything. But anything where you're duplicating other people's emotions? No, because you're actively aware of what you're doing. Um, oh no, I, I found that I can do things as an actress that as a, as a woman I could never do. Yeah. I can behave in ways as an actress acting a part that as an individual I wouldn't dream of behaving this way, saying, acting, and so on. That's why acting is an extraordinary outlet for me, who, 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 who am, who is really very private, inverted person, I am. But I was thinking of some people that actually become the roles, well I mean they act, the roles are them and they are the roles like Orson Welles, he mm. always appears to be larger than life. Mm. Um, did, did you enjoy working with him? Or, or yes I did, I did. I, I, um, we got along famously and I I don't mind working with big people like that. I rather like it. They bring, they challenge me and bring me up to their level of, and, and widths and breadths, you know. And yeah. uh, I, I'm never um, put off by them. Some people are. Some people are diminished by great big people like Orson Welles. But I found him not. He didn't do that to me. How about the Ethel, reverse effect. How about Ethel Barrymore? What was she like to work with? Now, I was awed by working with her, oddly enough, mm. because I felt that she she was just coming up to the end of her days, and she was in a wheelchair, and I thought, my God, this woman represents so much that has been wonderful in the American theatre that I am awed to be working with her. Mm. And I was. She's one of the few people that I've been awed by. And you worked, of course, with Zan Charisse, didn't you, who is uh, Sir Charisse's uh, niece-in-law, isn't That's she? That's right, yeah. niece-in-law. Yeah. Did you ever talk to Zan? No, I didn't. No. Yeah. I thought she was terrific. In yeah, of. she is. And is she doing well? Is she? Well, she is. I had a letter from her, and she's doing a, a musical called Cowboy, mm. which her dad directed, and they're hoping to do it next summer again. They did it in stock last summer and got very good notices and she got a wonderful notice from Walter Kerr mm -hmm. who's the the English uh, the American Har Harold Hobson mm -hmm. and um, Sandy review you know Sandy critique thing 
and uh, he just gave it to her all the way. So I hope the show's going to be done again next summer and then eventually come into New York. I think she could be a very big star. She's got a terrific charm. Yes. That's such a difficult part to do. Gypsy, very difficult. It? Very difficult indeed. Oh my gosh, yes. Because if she did manage to look so young and then and, and be yeah. very so sexy in the That's right. strip scene. But because I liked uh, Bonnie Lang. <laughs> oh yes, Bonnie is terrific. Because she had a, a sort of stage mother, doesn't she, herself? That must have been rather <laughs> yeah, in, enlightening for you, so I stayed to I think it was enlightening for her. Oh, yeah. For Mrs. Langford, who's a very nice woman indeed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we used to have our little jokes about that. She used to say, oh my God, she said, I see myself in you so often. She said, I see you standing in the wings watching Bonnie, and I see, then I see myself doing the same. And, doing the gestures and so on to get you know, sparkly, yeah. magic time, etc. And all of those little gimmicks that moms do to get their kids to perform up to par. Yeah. Um, of course, Rose goes way overboard. But uh, Mrs. Langford's a grand lady. And Barney's a great, she's a great little performer. I mean, she's, she's really good. It was a brilliant performance because she managed to send herself up. Absolutely. At the same time, which is... Yeah. It, was yeah. a, it was a lovely show because we waited so long for it. It was one of those things that everyone thought it was going to be an anticlimax. Yes. In fact, it wasn't at all. No. It didn't play long on Broadway, did it? It's not as long as it should have been. Oh, well, of course, it had see, been there before. It had been so. there before. Yes. We've been on the road for eight months. Yeah. So we, we were coming in to New York for 10 weeks, and we did extend it to 15. But I just couldn't go any further. I, I'd really come to the end of the line. Because of you know all of that tremendous vocal push and being on the road, and uh, finally my throat was just sort of I was just sort of feeling rotten. I just couldn't make it work the way I wanted to anymore. So I went to a doctor and he said, "Well, he said you've just been at it a bit too long. He said you've just got to lay off now." So I did, just as well. How do you manage to keep yourself? Um fit I and mean, you, you know, keep yourself slim and, and healthy and mm. well constant dedicated attention to it <laughs> yeah. you know I've just taken off 10 pounds after Christmas and I'm endlessly watching my weight and uh, keeping as healthy as I can you know walking and doing all those things trying to find some place to swim in London that soreness any ideas? Well, there's the Oasis, but I'm not sure. Oh, that's in uh, Tottenham Court Road. Really? Um, let me think it's the best place. So, I don't really know. No. What so if there's a sauna in uh, the Dolphin, uh, uh, the Dolphin Square? Let's call them up and I'll find out, because they've got a swimming pool. You can go for 75 days and swim. That's great exercise. Because that's something that, obviously, you, you do miss about Malibu, mm. is that you can't go out and swim. No, you can't jump in the pool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not that I did a great deal, in the hot summer I do, but I'm not a sort of fetishist about swimming every morning, you know, like 30 laps, like some people are. I should be, I suppose, but... Talking of swimming, you didn't uh, know Esther Williams, did you? Oh, yeah. yes. Very well, yeah. Gosh, yes. They were always making Esther Williams movies when I was at MGM. There was one stage where they always had the swimming pool, <laughs> and there was always about 20 girls who were practicing plugs in their ears and pulling muscles. And Did they ask you to do um, any of the, the commentary for That's Entertainment? No, they didn't. No, I wasn't in that. No. The, I was in it though, I was in the shop. You were in the, 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 <laughs> the marvellous scene, yeah. Yes. Uh, it's, it's funny because that piece of film, I don't, I don't care how unstage struck or star struck you are, but it, yes. it's, it's a very weird feeling in the pit of the stomach that all yeah. those people that were so familiar were actually sit sitting on one yes. long table, yes. and, you know, t together. Yes. Um, one thing I did notice about, the only thing I, I did notice was that uh, Lena Horne was completely ignored on the table. No one was talking to Lena Horne at all. Yeah. It, was, it was quite strange. Well, that is strange because they did love her at MGM and, uh, I mean, there's, there was no, uh, there's no feeling because she was black. There's yeah. certainly nothing like that. Well, I mean, there was, but nobody ever gave yeah. the slightest uh, indication that 
What was it like for gay people at MGM? And why were they tolerated, or did they try and hide it, or, or what? It's interesting to th you say that because I'm not aware now. Oh, well, I knew I knew because several producers <coughs> were gay, who, 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 you know. But um, among the actors and people, there seemed to be very few at that time. Do you think this was something that Louis B. Mayer actually worked, you know, he weeded out gay actors, you know, that he, he wanted his stars to be what they were on the screen? I suppose so. And that maybe when you said that they looked as good off screen, this was another mm -hmm. reason that he kept them on, that, you know, that they were real stars instead mm -hmm. of good looking actors who could be photographed to look good. Yes, I suppose that's true. Um, you see, it was never a question that came up, certainly in kind of conversation or general gossip at the studio. There was very little sort of gossip and talk about that. It was something that was simply never discussed. That may have been discussed up front in the, you know, the front office. I mean, if an actor was homosexual and he came across homosexual in a, in a, in a, in a, in a part and therefore they didn't use him. But I, I don't remember that ever coming up. You played, saying he isn't masculine enough, you know, for the part or something. You played quite a few emasculating parts, haven't you? Um, particularly mothers. Mm. It's a very unhealthy, possessive relationship with um, with sons. Do you think that basically the mother-son relationship is is open to lots of unhealthy aspects because of the, the proximity just to just to one woman, um, and that any of her faults are going to sort of colour his attitude to women? as he grows up? You know, Gosh, that's a huge question. The woman in Manchurian Candidate yes. obviously had a great influence on on her son, um, but it didn't, in, in the script, colour his attitude to women, but I mean, it could, it could do, as a, a very jealous mother could, in fact, um, turn him off. Oh, God. Oh, certainly, I, I do believe so, yes. I think that there are relationships. There are absolutely smothering mothers who do emasculate their sons and make their sons incapable of having relationships with other women. Yes, I'm sure of that. But also the um, thing could occur, it's happened in your case, where um, you've given a lot of attention to your children, and then when you start, you know, mm. going off, mm. they resent the fact that you're you're going off. You know, yes. I mean, there's a sort of selfishness on both sides. Yes, that's, I think that's very true. Um, I don't think that... Uh, Well, my children have had to settle for the fact that they had a successful mother. They've had to settle, uh, <coughs> as all children of well-known people do. It's a fact. It exists. They have to learn to live with it, and they have to design their lives around it or get away from it. And I think this, this is the thing. That, but if, if they're intelligent and broad in their thinking, they won't allow it to interfere with their spreading their wings and doing their own thing just as successfully. Yeah. Uh, and also your husband too. I mean, he's um, I mean, he's not well known, is he? I mean, he's not. I mean, you're not a show business couple, no. are you? Really? Well, no, we're not. Was this deliberate um, to sort of keep out of the limelight, or was it just happened? Like it's just happened that way. He's been. Uh, in the business for years and he was an enormously successful agent for the Morris Agency and he was associate head of production at MGM for seven years so he had a very glamorous job yeah. and um, has always been a very glamorous figure, he's a very attractive man and uh, this has made our relationship much easier because he got his attention uh, yes. in his way and I got mine in my way yeah. and and yet the two of us weren't dependent on the other's success, although we enjoyed the fact that we both had a whole life. Yeah, sure. You know. He's in New York at the present time. I'm sorry you didn't get to meet him. And is it nice having a husband as an agent? Does it smooth out lots of yes. problems? Yes, it's marvellous because we do get to be together. Yeah. He's retired from... Uh, business in the States now, uh, except for managing me, 
because uh, it meant that we were never together. I'd be here, he'd be there, kids would be somewhere else. And uh, it was a very unsatisfactory way to conduct a life. So we decided that we put all our eggs in one basket and concentrate on the family business, which is, uh, which is me at the moment. He's also interested in helping the kids. My daughter Deirdre is terribly pretty, it's absolutely beautiful, and she's a model, and may become an actress one of these days. I don't know. We'll see. Where is she at the moment? She's here in London. She lives with you, does she? No, no. She has a flat of her own. And she's very independent. She's just come from Brazil. She lived there for about nine months. And uh, she has an uh, Argentine boyfriend she's very fond of, who she lives with. And uh, my son Anthony is uh, pursuing a career in the theatre. He's um, also here in London. He's got his flat. What's he do? He's an actor. Uh, Anthony Shaw? Mm -hmm. What's he done? Hasn't done anything yet. He's just got out of drama school. Got, just got out of Weber Douglas, where he was, which is where I went. One thing I, I noticed at, uh, at MGM was the number of parking spaces which had famous names. Mm -hmm. You know, the Sun Junior. Yeah. Lots of. Um, when was this? When were you uh, there? About 1972. Oh yeah. It was just before the second lot was was sold. Ah. Oh, sure. um, and I thought then, you know, that it is much easier to get a job if you have a, a famous father or famous mm. mother, despite what people say. Yeah, it helps. It, it, it does, because obviously you would know the people in the business, you would know mm -hmm. the best people. Mm -hmm. um, because it doesn't always sort of uh, sustain you, does it? I mean, it's, no, it doesn't. You've got, you've to, got have to have it. You've got to have it, because yeah. I can open a door, but unless you can walk in and take a seat, uh, you, know, yeah. you ain't got the job. Right. So it can help, and it can also hinder, I'm afraid. Just, with just one last question, and that's um, about Elizabeth Taylor, another another child star. Mm. Um, it must have been quite interesting seeing her grow up in a great acceleration, mm. um, because obviously she was playing parts much, much older than her real age. Yes, she was. Um, she was very young. Did this seem to have any effect on her, or did she take it in her, in her stride? Oh, I think it had quite an effect on her. Yeah. I think her whole growing up was ter terribly hurried. Her first marriage to Nicky Hilton and all of that. Did you? It was like you a story. Though, you? You know? Were you? No, I'm, I'm sure you were a bridesmaid at some stars wedding. You? No, not me. <laughs> <gasps> no, I wasn't. I wasn't. Do you, Do you see any of the, uh, the MGM people now? I mean, are you friendly with anyone that you were attending? Not with? really. I see them. We're all very warm, friendly acquaintances, you know, like Cause Debbie Reynolds and people like that. She and I, we bump into each other on the road often, because she's yes, yes. off and out with things, Irene and yeah. doing that. And Ava Gardner lives in London, doesn't I she? I know, I never see her. Peter says he sees her a lot. He's always bumping into her, but I never see her. Did you like Ava Gardner? Oh, yes, she was a terrific girl. Yeah. I thought she was lovely. She was beautiful. And which was, which was the most beautiful of the MGM girls, as far as you know? So. Um, well, Ava was... Ava certainly, certainly, I, I certainly admired her, I think. Um, Greer Garson, strangely enough, was absolutely marvellous when she was a young woman. Who was the most difficult star of MGM? Mm. I can't remember. Um, well, difficult for you to work with, one thing. notoriously difficult. Mm. Sounds awfully Pollyanna-ish, but I really can't think of anybody that ever gave me any trouble. You know what I mean? It's just extraordinary, really. But uh, um, I guess no, I, I can't really say anybody gave me any flack. You know what I mean? <laughs> These are women stars we're talking about now, right? And, and, and uh, there weren't that many that I worked with, you see. Just like more men. Do you think it was because in many ways you weren't a threat to them? Yes, I do. I do. I think that's the reason. 
that I was in this curious little cubicle of my own where I was an actress, a young character actress, yeah. and um, very earnest and always characterizing. Nobody characterized in those days, you know. But I was always playing something other than myself, never playing myself.